Okay, starting up. Okay, hello everybody. Um, Walter Yu with um, Caltrans um, here in Sacramento, out of our headquarters office. Um, I was formerly, um, while we were developing this presentation, working with our environmental division, working with um, our trash control efforts, and so that's statewide. Since then, moved on to enterprise data governance manager, so uh, moving on to other things, but still involved with data. And with that, uh, Gary Conley will come up. Sure, hi. Uh, Gary Conley with Second Nature. Um, so I'm gonna kinda set it up and then Walter's gonna knock it down as we, as we do. And I turned off the slides, okay. I'll just try every button until I get the right one. Okay, so uh, Second Nature, Caltrans are, oops, a little closer, are collaborating on a project to try to make trash data collection more efficient uh, throughout the state. Um, lest we forget, this is the size of the problem. Um, we have a trash gyre swirling around in the Pacific Ocean, about 88,000 tons, coverage the size of Texas, somewhere between uh, California and Hawaii, and one of the important sources of trash to that gyre is urban stormwater. Um, so in order to try to prevent trash from getting into the storm drain systems, uh, 2015, we have come online the trash amendments. Uh, there's basically two ways for cities to come into compliance. Either uh, you can install devices that have uh, spaces no bigger than five millimeter to capture all that trash before it gets in there. Of course, you can't install those devices everywhere for logistical concerns and um, you know, local flooding risks, et cetera. So where you don't install those devices, you have to rely on other institutional controls, whether that's street sweeping, education outreach, increased trash pickups. But we need a way to verify those things are actually doing their job. And so that's where these visual assessment methods come in, which is on the left, right side of the, the slide there. So pretty simple, there's just, um, visual proxies walking around on a road, um, and those are connected to estimates of trash uh, loading in volume per area. Set of colors up there going from green to purple, green being good, purple being the trashiest. The challenge with these methods is that trash on city streets is pretty variable over both space and time, so uh, it's really dependent on the sampling design to ensure that we get the information that we need out of these methods, right? What we need is to be able to characterize trash conditions to a degree of confidence that's acceptable and to be able to detect changes over time as we go forward. This, uh, we're supposed to be eliminating trash inputs to storm drain systems within the next 10 years or so. Um, just to put this into context, here's some data from the city of Salinas. The left map shows those actual trash visual assessments, they're called on-land visual trash assessments, or OVTA. And then on the right hand, it's the uh, quantified uncertainty associated with that sequence of measurements taken from 2017 to uh, 2018, quantified as a Bayesian credibility interval. Um, these data and methods are all uh, just published in a journal article last month. Um, Come talk to me afterwards, I can give you the link if you're really interested. But the punchline here is that uh, those areas that we see that are the trashiest are also those areas that we have the lowest degree of certainty. So those areas that we need to know the most about, we're the least sure of. These methods, they're also embedded in a, uh, a stormwater platform called To Inform that cities throughout the Central Coast are using to satisfy their MS4 trash permit requirements. And now about 25 cities also in the Chesapeake Bay are using these same metrics to satisfy their requirements. But what's most important here is that it's actually difficult to get the type of coverage that we need to, uh, to gain that acceptable level of certainty. Um, so we need sort of an intuitive sense of what kind of coverage we need. These are the same data from that same study and uh, the graphs show the degree of spatial association from one trash condition measurement to uh, its neighbor. And what we see, first of all, if we break it out by the different stormwater drainages, as we see in Salinas here, um, we see some heterogeneity or you can be 
that the strength of that association might be between 60 to half a kilometer away. But most importantly, we see that the significance of that spatial association or autocorrelation, we say, uh, tapers off pretty severely. So that if your measurements are definitely more than two kilometers apart in a city like Salinas, well, you're probably missing some pretty important information. So we're getting the picture here now, right? We, uh, we have high variance in the data, few measurements, certainty is low. If we have a lot of measurements and the variance is low, the certainty is high. So what we need to do is figure out a way to get greater certainty for those areas that have high data variance. Trouble is, it's expensive to walk around doing these trash assessments, so we need to figure out a more cost-effective way to do that. Fortunately, trash is sort of a unique pollutant. We can see it lying around on the ground there. That's, uh, that's great, and, and our machines can see it as well. So the terms um, artificial intelligence and machine learning are pretty uh, fashionable uh, these days, but really they're not um, very different from our more common basket of statistical methods that we use, right? We have, a, we have a pile of data, we want to understand it to the degree that we can make some predictions in those areas that we don't have data, not so different from uh, regression analysis, uh, principal components, ANOVA, things that you know, we're all kind of more familiar with. In implementation, it's a little bit different because we need a lot more computational power than we now have access to, um, and we need a lot more data that we've just become more and more expert at managing. So it's really a problem that's pretty built for application of these tools. So I'm gonna pass over to Walter to tell you how we actually do that and also um, what we do when the trash AI uh, becomes self-aware and decides to have its own ideas and become our benevolent robotic overlords, right? Right, yeah. Okay, I'm not sure if we figured that out yet. No. Thank you, Gary. And, um, as I think Gary pointed out and set it up the problem, um, you know, we at Caltrans have to meet the statewide trash amendments as do everybody else uh, within the state of California permittees. And so our challenge has been the manual portion of the um, visual assessment. So we have to go out and drive with the clipboard. So we started thinking about, um, as we're doing some analysis, um, thinking about AIs, it's come in vogue, um, how to use that to our advantage. So. Um, kind of a quick primer, uh, one of the things we came up with, and you'll see that up on the slide, is object detection with computer vision. Um, as you all have kind of come and know, image recognition is becoming very fashionable. And so uh, it started out with uh, classification, right? Like photos of cats and dogs, which is which, and then they moved on to object classification, which is what you see right there in the image there, is that's just traffic counts, basically taking, um, detecting objects in a, in a photo. Um, you know, they're getting better and better with the technology, so it's, you know, went from still images in the, in the uh, video. Um, and so it's already in use. So uh, Keep America Beautiful has a re reasonably large project on GitHub um, using Google TensorFlow, which is one implementation of this technology. Underlying, there's different algorithms that run it, but basically they scan and sweep an image and turn it into numbers, analyze it statistically, and give you back a score, um, what we could typically call confidence interval, zero to one, um, kind of as Gary's was saying, just being confident of our results and making it more quantitative in nature, just because trash assessments right now are quite subjective. You're walking with a clipboard and you're scoring and you're comparing notes, and for us, we're driving, um, which it makes it even more challenging. Next, um, another already in use as illustrated in a point is just autonomous vehicles. We're heading in that direction, but um, guidance systems, um, you know, object detection again plays a big part of that. At Caltrans, we're also using it for asset inventorying. So when we collect our LiDAR imagery, um, detecting objects and signs within our imagery, so it's already in use within our agency. Google Images and Facebook tagging is you all are, again, um, whether you know it or not, it's image recognition and face recognition are becoming uh, ubiquitous technologies. And so as that comes more mainstream, um, you know, we'd like to leverage that. So the, our current uh, process for um, OVTAs um, is basically we're using a protocol B according to the uh, BASMA, which is the Bay Area Association of Storm, Ma Storm, Manage Storm Management Associations. We're using protocol B with a uh, vehicle mounted camera on a GPS, which uh, takes photos every tenth of a mile, but we record every um, half a mile. So what you see there in upper right is an example. So we have the camera mounted and it just points rear. We drive in this low lane. Again, um, 
you know, the, the people, our, our staff or consultants that go out there to do the monitoring, they can only see what's out the window at one, snap, one snapshot in time. So again, it's subjective, right? If you're driving and you're driving hours on end, um, human error, subjectivity, and um, I like to compare it as like almost being like a baseball empire. You're trying to see things fly by 60 miles an hour and, you know, again, trying to reduce that human error and subjectivity. Um, so we like to, you know, transition into basically, and I'll get into this, is using some image recognition. And on the bottom right there is just some basic object detection um, to, again, help us automate that task, uh, remove the subjectivity. And then also this translates and plays into our asset management and resource management. So as we collect these scores, we're already loading it into our geospatial database for mapping for compliance requirements. But as we, you know, really fully automate this process, we could basically drive, do our field data collection, do our image recognition, and then plot those in the geospatial data. So we're kind of end to end um, doing field data collection and dig digitization. So implementation, um, I think trying to make it in disclaimer, I'm not a, I'm not an employee of Microsoft or spokesperson, but we did use Microsoft Computer, Computer Vision, uh, what you see on the right hand side there. Uh, we selected it because it's the most approachable. Um, I did do some work on TensorFlow and we've experimented with different technologies, but Custom Vision was um, just very nice to integrate with and what you see on the lower right there is just the dashboard. So Custom Vision is you know, free with a trial. Um, it's powered by Azure on the back end. So um, joke around the office is that there's no excuse not to use it because we have Outlook. So we should be able to just log in with our DOT accounts and fire away if, of course, I got crickets, but uh, you know, on with the show, right? Um, so the benefits um, with Custom Vision and it, URL super simple, customvision.ai. So if, you know, when you get back to your desk, fire it up. They got a free trial. Um, their documentation is really good. Um, First foremost, there's no coding re, uh, required. So, um, you know, we were looking at different technologies right now. We're also trying to pilot a study with Second Nature. Um, and so as a part of that, we're looking at different technologies. But for now, custom vision, um, it's easy to share the model. So the workflow is that um, you're gonna go ahead and upload some photos, train them, and then you'll have a trained model. And with that, you can share it. And that's the, uh, you know, the, the reproducibility portion of it and being able to share. Um, and then, as I said, um, being hosted on uh, Microsoft Azure. And so, um, you know, it plays nice with most ecosystems, plays on a Microsoft platform. Um, it's cloud-based. Um, and so the examples I'm using are with Google Street View. Um, but again, you can upload, and this applies beyond trash. So it could apply to um, aerial imagery or satellite imagery. And Microsoft also has plenty of examples using satellite imagery, trying to detect rooftops, or Kaggle has some competitions with trying to do ships in the bay. So. Those are common use cases. And of course, relatively use co low cost because it's hosted on Azure. So some next steps, um, you know, we're again doing a formal study with, um, you know, with Second Nature and with our, um, one of our a &E consultants, Michael Baker, to more formalize the field data collection, our methodology. Um, also refining the model. So initial training we got with about 50 to 100 images, we got about 80% accuracy. Um, so we'd like to improve and, and refine that. Um, and then also we'd like to explore this as a part of the uh, trash monitoring work group, uh, which we had our, I guess, our first meeting yesterday and uh, wish to explore different protocols or different ways to implement these technologies. And the demo is on GitHub, so um, we'll share this out. But um, again, this speaks to the strength of this technology is that um, you're able to, once you have your model trained, you can download the files um, in basically any flavor. You could do it as mobile. You could do it as a Docker image. And so this shared is a Docker image, but um, it also has an endpoint so you can share with your team. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over for questions. So these efforts are awesome. I'm curious how enforceable and how much of the cleanup you're actually able to do after starting to detect these levels of trash. You can talk about cleanup. <laughs> sure, so I, obviously this was focused on technology, but on the other hand, um, you know, kind of shameless plug for Caf Casca conference this year, we're gonna talk about similar things, but kind of at a larger scale. And so this ties in with our, um, with our maintenance forces. 
So on the back end, we have a full database for deploying our and managing our maintenance forces. And so this ties in with that. So we have our geospatial, data space, uh, geospatial database, and as we know where the high trash areas are, we can more quickly um, deploy our forces there. Um, and so we create a feedback loop. We're gonna send out our crews, do the cleanup, do an assessment in between, score it, put it into the database, and then compare it with what we're actually picking up. And then now that we have the visual assessments in between, it again reinforces that loop. Whereas before we were trying to estimate, we did an initial survey and then we were using mostly the trash collection data, but now we'll put the two together. And then that way we can deploy our forces. And again, I think the proof is in the pudding, right? If we go out and do our visual assessments, then we can hopefully see that the uh, trash level is dropping. So, and that's also our roadmap to compliance. So this is helping us. It's not our kind of go-to. We're still gonna do our visual assessments, but this would help automate part of that process and reduce the error. It sounds like this data set will be really useful for other groups that are also um, having to keep up with their compliance since the areas that you're monitoring are going to overlap with areas that, that they're also managing. I'm wondering what's your plan for sharing that information with them and with the broader community? Well, I can talk about the data. Um, I mean, well, the I, I'm not sure it's clear, but the what results from this study, the, the algorithm itself, is, is going to be open source. So if anybody wants to actually use it on their own imagery that they collect, they'll be free to do so. Um, in terms of the data collected itself, um, the cities all own that data that they're collecting. So it's a, I, I understand what you're saying. It, it could be really valuable in, in terms of like understanding how we can have data interoperability for different types of trash data that are being collected, but it's going to have to be a coordinated effort with local jurisdictions to be able to have those data available, whether it's Caltrans or a city or a county. I think, yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think the, the best venue to talk about is probably the regional um, stormwater monitoring groups. Um, BASMA, we have one on the Central Coast, Mr. Swimp, um, uh, Southern California, Analog. You know, all those groups are, are good places to bring this up. I'm not, you know, like I say, it's like, it's, it's a great idea. It's just um, sometimes people tend to be sensitive about those data that are being used for compliance, just like their water quality data. Sure. So that's a very good point about open source. We actually, as we're piloting the study, um, we are doing a part of it internally for our own use, but we were thinking ahead, and that's why I shared the portion that I did using Google Street View, and that gets the starting point. Another good place is the Trash Monitoring Work Group, of course, would be happy to you know, explore options, and you know, we definitely don't want to be closed source in that effort. Um, I've also shared this work with Code for Sacramento, so I volunteer with Code for Sacramento, which is part of Code for America shared the technology, and also Microsoft makes it very easy. Um, they've been very open that they've generalized the algorithm behind it. So whereas in TensorFlow or other technologies, it takes hundreds of thousands of photos to get reasonable accuracy, uh, Constant Vision does it with about 50 to 100 photos, and they're very transparent about it. Uh, Microsoft Research has white papers about the technology. It's basically a very generalized um, artificial neural network. Um, and it's meant for consumer facing usage. So again, encourage everybody that's looking forward at the, in this area, looking to trim down some of your um, OVTA time or at least to QA some of your work to take a look at it um, just because of the low cost, um, ease of use and just ability to share. Um, so yeah, I think um, we're, you know, we want, we open up that avenue, I think. Um, also um, Keep America Beautiful. They have like a couple thousand images available up on GitHub. Um, you just look them up on GitHub and you'll see the repository and it's done in TensorFlow, they've shared the model. So again, it speaks to the power of this approach where it's reproducible, it's transparent, and you can then collaborate also with people, not just on your team, but a larger community. Is there also efforts to fairly specifically identify the pieces of trash? You know, is it people walking by and just throwing a lot on the street, or is it a, a neighborhood that just is leaving a lot of trash out? Because those management efforts are going to take more than just constantly going out there.
I think this gets into, I think especially in the Bay Area where we obviously have, you know, that spearheaded our effort and, you know, obviously rippling into statewide. Um, I think it kind of borders on that, you know, I guess politically or sensitive data. Um, I think we just look at a standpoint of kind of a, a needs, right? So if we're looking at trash and actually maintenance treats it like another objective. So they have their kind of regular level of service checks. And so they have a full program going checking all assets. So they treat trash that way. And so we try to treat it the same. We try to look at doing assessments, being objective about it. Um, though, yes, we probably could. Um, there's really two levels, um, areas that are high as far as location, but also within each photo. So we're actually doing an object detection. Um, and as far as we're picking up, I think we'll start to, as we install devices, um, trash characterization, um, studies that we're doing with this automation, I think we'll begin to understand more of it. I think right now we're in a triaging phase of, okay, let's get the requirements, let's meet the compliance, let's get all set up. And as we scale, I think we'll get that data and be able to make more sense of it, so. Okay. I think um, that, that's definitely one of the primary uses of this once it, once it gets going, for sure. I mean, the compliance is one side, but what, what do you do as a jurisdiction to, to, to solve the problem, right? That's the other information that you get. And right now with OVTA, I mean, we have that information, right, in the platform that we have folks using, um, you have hotspots that would tell you which neighborhood you might want to focus uh, trash mitigation efforts. It's just that um, you know, there's, you're only doing these assessments two to three times a year. So there's a time component that you're, you're probably missing information that we could fill in with the automation, have basically fill the same function of informing cities for where they should focus their efforts, but on shorter time frames so that they wouldn't miss that information. And this is Greg speaking from behind everyone, sorry. Um, I'll just add that there is a trash data hackathon that we're gonna do again. We did it last fall at SFEI's uh, in Richmond office in October, I think it was. We'll probably aim for the same time for those of you who are passionate and interested in helping us move the ball forward on all this. Um, I encourage you to uh, follow the Twitter account that's associated with the hashtag for this event. So it's CA Water Data Dive and we'll announce it more formally then. But one of the projects that the, my staff is working on is a trash tracker that's a street sweeper, computer vision, analog project and some of these others that would have the potential to do because of the, um, it's a little slower, a little different than some of the other um, methods of collecting the data. It, it may have the ability to also en enhance the object identification. And this is what we uh, did datathon work on yesterday and prior was then how do you bring that together in with literati data, with other data, with there's all sorts of really interesting stuff happening. So if you want to track the topic, um, follow us. And thanks. And I think dovetailing on that again, we'll be at the Cascade Conference talking about similar topics. Um, I'm always happy to talk trash, talk data with you guys. So look me up, Walter, your LinkedIn, Caltrans, pretty easy to find. And uh, yeah, so thank you. One last plug, I'd say also join the trash monitoring work group for the, through the California Water Quality Monitoring Council. We're always looking for new members to the energy, so um, please reach out to those. And also, um, the kickoff, Karen Mogus kicked off yesterday and asked the council members to stand up and there weren't any in the room yet, but we have some now. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, Grant Sharp, who is our council member who is representing um, uh, Stormwater, um, and he also res represents Casca. Um, Peter Vroom, who's right here, and he represents um, Water Supply and Aqua. And then there's also Jared Voskul in the back, who um, represents POTWs and, uh, and uh, CASA. So if you uh, want, have any questions, um, and you can see me, there's also our booth out there. I, unfortunately, running around and not there to man it a lot, but um, there's some information out there. And feel free to reach out to me if you want to join any of the work groups. Um, that'd be great. Next up, uh, Tony Hale from SFEI. Come on up, Tony. I will. All right. Can you hear me? Let's see. Is this working? Um, how's everybody doing? Everybody looking good? All right. Well, thank you for, uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. I am here um, on behalf of a group of people. Uh, I'm working on a project that is uh, funded by the Ocean Protection Council, the California Ocean Protection Council. 
in partnership with the State Water Resources Control Board, uh, co-led by the Southern California Coastal Water Research uh, Project and Shelley Moore, uh, specifically, along with, with myself and my other team members, uh, Pete and Lorenzo from the San Francisco Estuary Institute. So um, what I'm talking about today is actually just a piece of a broader project. Um, but that piece focuses on uh, remote sensing and machine learning. <clears throat> There's a lot, of, you'll find a lot of complementarity uh, between what I'm gonna be talking about and uh, what Gary and Walter talked about. Um, but I think also there'll be some uh, new kind of angles on, on things, hopefully. Um, and so the kind of main point here is that combining remote sensing and machine learning, um, you at least have potential for real breakthrough. Um, and the project, as I mentioned, um, is designed to establish a library of standards that are really of known accuracy, precision, repeatability, and practicality for monitoring trash. So this project that we're doing is validating those, those methods. But then we're also looking at new and innovative um, methods uh, specifically tied to unoccupied aerial systems or unoccupied aerial vehicles and machine learning. And so that's what we're talking about really today. Um, I don't know if this was really legible to you, but uh, I'm gonna be kind of skipping through some things that, that uh, Gary and Walter uh, already covered, but uh, the problems are, are common to both that um, trash monitoring is really highly dependent on space and time. That is, um, being able to cover a broad area is very challenging. Uh, being able to go out multiple times because trash is so ephemeral, ephemeral it moves around. And so being able to kind of capture that uh, a kind of synoptic view of the landscape is, is very challenging. And also achieving uh, accurate volume estimates from qualitative assessments, so the rapid trash assessment methods, uh, is a coarse conversion. Um, and so is there anything we can do to refine that further? And uh, then, you know, monitoring is very time intensive. Uh, and Gary and Walter have come up with some really creative ways to um, try to address these challenges, and, and we think that we have as well. So the target audiences for what I'm talking about today, it, uh, it includes local stormwater agencies, local monitoring programs, municipal, county, regional organizations, as well as statewide uh, monitoring uh, programs and citizen science groups. So it's really meant to embrace a lot of these different uh, demographics. And uh, specific to our project, the UAS task objectives are to identify the circumstances under which we can deploy unoccupied aerial syst systems. And you'll notice that I'm saying unoccupied aerial systems as a genderless uh, term. Uh, it's uh, synonymous with uh, sometimes called unmanned, but uh, we're trying to uh, be a little bit uh, open there. Um, and uh, also, uh, we want to determine uh, the optimal machine learning algorithms for identifying trash in the environment and determining trash levels in a given area. So when I'm talking about these, these kind of uh, drones or uh, unoccupied aerial systems, um, we found that using off-the-shelf uh, inexpensive equipment, we can achieve quarter inch image resolution. This is flying at, at 100 feet. Um, so just by way of illustration, uh, you have the above uh, clip of the same area from, from Google. Uh, it's combining, you know, what that's illustrating is two things. First of all, it's coarser resolution, but also it's a specific moment in time when the, you had tidal inundation and you might want to see the same area um, at a specific moment, um, this is a wetland around um, uh, uh, the, the San Francisco Bay on, on, in, um, in near Richmond. And you might also want to see a certain season. And so you can see you have finer resolution and, and, uh, and it's a particular moment in time, particular season. Um, but also you can go from, you know, being able to see things from a distance and really zoom in to you know, what, what used to be dots be, becomes um, ducks, and that's at a, at a quarter resolution. You can, you can zoom in e even further. So what are our initial findings just from the imagery as we were flying over 
areas that um, had been inaccessible uh, for the large part. There are a number of places where you can't, you can't traipse, you can't kind of walk across a wetland, but you can fly with the right permits, you can fly across a wetland. And so we found that what looked to be you know, pristine um, from the land view, you know, looking out over, the, this is Corte Madera Marsh, uh, it turns out you, know, you could spot quite a bit of trash just uh, kind of nestled among, among the vegetation. And so these little dots there are, are noting the trash. And zooming in, you can see a tire, you can see you know, a bottle. And so part of the opportunity here is to uh, deploy these uh, you know, low-flying uh, drones uh, to be able to illuminate areas that have either been inaccessible and might, might be uh, sinks for trash, um, or just uh, being able to expand what can be walked in uh, by, by a small group of people. And then using, uh, taking that imagery and using machine learning to kind of further expand things, um, we, can, we can develop these algorithms to detect trash, just presence absence, um, and that's kind of along the lines, if, unless I'm mistaken, of what, what uh, this first pass of what, what Walter and Gary were doing. But then also do, uh, to address the, the question posed earlier, to do some speciation to you know, kind of apply some, some basic categories to the trash as well. And uh, from there, we can also calculate volume. So taking the detection of trash as objects and then making some judgments of volume. And we can also then calculate the trashiness level of the landscape. Um, and we think that it's most effective to use machine learning uh, to identify, you know, is it effective to identify specific uh, categories of objects, um, calculating volumes, or determining the, those qualitative levels? Well, we think, uh, you know, and can we achieve a, an acceptable level of accuracy and precision um, using these new tools? Um, so, we, we, you know, we have some, some videos here, uh, some of which are, yeah, if, can we just play that one? Is that playable? So this is just an illustration of, of Pete Gohanan launching a drone at the Puerto Madera Marsh. We had a DFW spotter there, that was the other gentleman in the image. And he was there to, to determine whether we were disturbing the wildlife. And uh, from the kind of sound of bees flying there that you heard, um, he determined that no, there was actually, you can't see it in that particular image. Um, thank you very much. Uh, but there, there, there was a, a heron just about 20 feet to our left that kept feeding while we were flying. So um, that's really satisfied them. Um, some of the challenges, though, of flying uh, a drone in, in, in current, um, our current moment here is flying over open water is challenging, not just because, you know, if things go wrong and, you, and the drone, you know, loses power, you've lost it uh, to, you know, sinking into the water, um, but, but also because then the results are kind of hard to stitch together into an orthorectified image. Um, so, so there are challenges there. Um, monitoring over creeks. Is, is another habitat we're interested in, but those with real heavy canopy are difficult to, to kind of peer down through the canopy. Uh, flying near buildings, you can't really fly over dwelling units. Um, flying in, in heavy shadow where, you know, the shadow is so dark that you can't really peer through it and flying in inclement weather. Um, airports are an exclusion zone, right? So there are rules with that, uh, that prohibit you from flying near airports and there's a kind of sphere of influence around the airport that you, you can't violate. And then acquiring permits is currently, it's a bit of uncharted territory, so every time you talk to a different agency, they have a different policy for issuing permits, and it can be very time consuming to, to get those permits. Now, mind you, a lot of people don't, don't bother to do that. There are a number of, certainly, you know, consumers, um, home flying, uh, people who, who fly their drones for, for personal uh, use, they're not getting permits a lot of times, and that, sets a certain uh, expectation and standard which, uh, which we wouldn't want to follow on a professional level. So uh, among the things we want to do uh, is to adhere to the rules, to follow the rules for, for getting permits and, and to always seek those. Um, so with machine learning, uh, we, we detect trash and we estimate those, those volumes. Um, I'm going to skip through this because uh, Gary and Walter covered it so well. But so the promise here is using the, this, this uh, flying imagery machine, we can build a, a synoptic a snapshot of, of, um, a, of the landscape 
um, and then be able to refly again to build more temporal density uh, at that low cost. Um, and that's partly because with a lot of other methods, you might send out teams uh, to be practical and capture the landscape, whereas you can send out two people, uh, a pilot and a spotter, to do um, a much larger area than, than a team would be able to cover in a, in a day. And we can also refly the using the exact same flight plan to uh, capture that landscape and see change over time. Uh, and we can also, because we can, we can fly uh, more space, we can see greater diversity across the, the environment. Um, and, and, you know, the, while we're using this, uh, this imagery for machine learning, uh, this can continue to be a library for people to go back and, uh, and, and look at. So we are going to be sharing our imagery. Um, and so that, that imagery, um, so just to kind of connect to, to, to talks before, Orestes mentioned stack, and so the stack framework is something we're looking very seriously into as a way to, to structure some of the imagery sharing we're doing. Um, but, but our imagery, because we're collecting it ourselves and we're, we're always trying to be as open as possible, we will be sharing both the uh, machine learning algorithm and the imagery. And then, um, you know, being able to collect the imagery for trash, but then also, you know, squeeze as much value out of that imagery as possible. Being able to get structure from motion to have kind of what you might call, you know, a poor person's LIDAR, um, and to be able to kind of characterize uh, different stream channels in, in different ways, as well as to do vegetative condition monitoring. Um, you can do a lot of stuff from the imagery beyond the trash. So it kind of adds even more value. So some of the initial findings. Um, I'm going to share with you, uh, you know, kind of by way of a, a it seems like a tangent, but we did an experiment with, in collaboration with the California Tobacco Control Program where they really wanted to, to you know, as we were showing our early findings, they wanted to know um, what, what kind of tobacco related trash we could spot from the sky. And so what you're seeing here in the image, um, believe it or not, tobacco trash isn't what it used to be. Uh, you have a combination of e-cigarettes, you have a lot of these, what are up at the top called juices, which are the kind of flavorings that you would put into e-cigarettes. Of course, every, you know, e-cigarette using adult loves, you know, cherry flavor and bubble gum because these aren't targeting children. Um, so, you know, <laughs> uh, when you see these, it's, it's I, I must say, just as a sidelight, it's, it's pretty scary to see all of these products. Um, then they're finding their way into the environment. A lot of times because kids are using them and they go out to the edges of dwellings, they go into creeks, they go, they deposit them directly into the places where we're very often uh, deeply concerned about. And so you find these products out there. So what we did is we borrowed these products. We didn't buy them. We borrowed them from the California Tobacco Control Program. We placed them out into the landscape in a very, uh, in a seeded uh, situation where we had a, a quadrat um, and we, we placed them into the quadrat and carefully noted uh, and counted just how, uh, where they were. Um, and we noted the numbers, types, volume, et cetera. Then what we did is we, f we flew over the landscape at various um, uh, altitudes, 30 feet, 60 feet, 100. Um, producing then these images uh, at different resolutions because you know resolution is really a function of, of distance when it comes to these these particular instruments, and then we had uh, someone note carefully kind of uh, what was in each uh, quadrant of the quadrat, and then also we had another person uh, in independently count on the basis of the images. So this is a manual process, all right, and so here's an example of of the landscape. It's a grassy area, which adds some challenge, which is what we wanted. And here are the results um, overall. So how, how am I doing for time? You're great. You got it. Okay, good, good. Um, so we have um, on the far left-hand side, you can actually see it better up here than I can see it in front of me. So we have um, the ground survey. That's kind of the ultimate measure of truth. And then kind of falling down uh, as, as the altitude increases, you have the fidelity to that, that ultimate measure of truth with the orange representing the total. And then we separated into two categories, tobacco, trash related, and then other trash, right? So we were, for this purpose, we were interested in speciating along anything tobacco related, 
which, as you can see, it was already very diverse, right? You had little, little, little bottles and, and other pieces of trash. So it's, it's, I think it's pretty remarkable that we were able to get as much, look at the, the kind of levels of trash data, it falls off as soon as you go from 60 feet to 100 feet of the blue line, the trash data, right, the, the, the tobacco trash. Um, so it's, it, that, I think that's pretty remarkable. And then when you go into the, the quadrants, the independent little quadrants, you can see that sometimes it was, it was remarkably well aligned. So there is some variability uh, just given the, the different types of, of objects you would encounter, but, um, but we did find that there was uh, sometimes great alignment up to 60 feet, and we saw very little difference between the 30 feet, the very highly resolved, and the 60 feet, which was, was less um, resolved. You'll see that there is this weird anomaly in the upper right-hand corner where the total is greater than what was really there, so there were some false positives. And so it seems like if we were to do this in the wild, if we, this was a controlled experiment, but if we were to roll this out, that 60 feet might be good enough um, and that allows us to kind of cover more space. Um, but we might encounter false positives. We found that time of day was a, a big driver of things, that is shadows um, could, could influence things. Um, better to have overcast than, than super bright uh, dark shadows. And, um, and then being able to, to capture the imagery and then rerun this experiment with different practitioners is potentially a very powerful diagnostic tool. And so what we have here, um, I'm now shifting to, you know, kind of imagery collection to looking at uh, machine learning. So, um, you know, I would say that, that Gary and Walter kind of covered this, so I'm going to jump to the next slide. Um, what we find is that, um, you know, in-person uh, trash surveys provide a real great measure of truth for us so that we can validate our machine learning results against those on the ground uh, surveys. So we're fortunate that we're coordinating with groups like BASMA, with the Southern California the Stormwater Monitoring Coalition and others to give us that measure of truth. And then we can, um, we can apply some of these, these innovations. Um, I'm glad it looks better up there than it does in front of me. But you have um, different object detection algorithms. Uh, we're using TensorFlow, just as Walter and and uh, Gary mentioned, uh, we're not using Microsoft's, we're using our, the kind of uh, open off the shelf. Um, and that was because we really wanted to be able to share without concerns for any licensing. And I may be wrong about whether that's a concern with, uh, for, for our, our, our colleagues here. Um, but we have um, different, different ways that, that machine learning is used. Um, so the, just to give you kind of taking a step back about what, how machine learning works um, is that you have some input you, can, you need to pre-process the, pre the data into some machine-readable format that might be taking an image and kind of breaking it down into in chunks or interpreting that, that image. And then you produce two different data sets, one data set used for training, another data set used for testing. Then the goal is to train the model. You train the model using uh, different annotations, and then you can save that model. Once you have that model, that algorithm is sometimes uh, is the term used, then you can, uh, detect, you can take your training data set and uh, see if how well it can uh, predict the uh, detection of what you've already annotated, and that gives you uh, some measure of effectiveness. Uh, so this is an example of some annotations that we did. And you have um, your, you know, the, the process for taking, I'm gonna skip through this in the interest of time, I'm running out of time. So that's a restatement of, of uh, what, what we did through, the, through this particular project. And what I'm showing you here is the annotated versus detected uh, objects. Um, so annotated is on the right-hand side, detected is on the left in these, 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 in these pairs of images, um, along with the confidence interval. So you have here 100% uh, plastic um, is, is the, the uh, annotated. Uh, here you have 81% uh, plastic uh, confidence interval on the left versus 100% uh, on the right, um, and so on. So you can see sometimes it, it's successful in looking at this very stochastic image of grass and things mixed in and rocks and being able to pull out the trash. So we're very pleased with some of the initial results of being able to fly this. Uh, it's not perfect, of course, um, but uh, just the idea that, that it can distinguish between trash and rocks and other things in the environment um, is, is very exciting um, and, you know, with, with, with some confidence. 
So the project timeline that we're working on is uh, that we've, you know, we're kind of coming around the bend, if you were, if as it were, where we have um, uh, deployed one. We've done one tr uh, season where we've done image collection, where we've developed the algorithm. Uh, the goal now is to do a little bit more image collection with, with the goal of annotating it and running it through the um, machine learning algori algorithm, not with the goal of, of developing, further developing that, that algorithm, but rather for, um, for detecting trash uh, as part of a, a testing phase. Um, so we're, we're um, very pleased with the way things are going, and we think that the, the, what, the work that that I've presented today, I think really is very complementary to both the street sweeping project that, that uh, Greg mentioned earlier, as well as the on land visual assessment, this being more uh, geared towards uh, different habitats, wetlands and, and, and rivers and creeks and streams. So thank you very much. Any questions? Hey, Tony, on the um, getting to uh, the object detection to the volumes, Walter and I have talked a little bit about this. It sounded like from what you said, the, the approach would be to identify what the object is and know something about how big that is. And is, is, that, is, is that the way that you would get there? Yes, exactly. Yeah, okay. to, to get some sense of if it's a cup, then we know that an average cup size is right. this big. And then we can make some judgments about volume. Got it. Yeah. Cool. And being able then to do the volume-based assessments on the ground and, and kind of match it up to what would be predicted through the, through the machine learning algorithm is, is, is important. Right. So Tony, if you're applying this in the wild, what's your sense about sort of false positive versus false negative, which do you think is a bigger problem in terms of error rates, you know, counting sticks as trash or missing things, which do you think is a bigger problem in terms of the um, problem and the ease of solving that problem? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Eric. I think that the, um, you know, I, I, I think that false positives, that is the the machine learning al algorithm detecting just anything as trash that might be just natural um, would be um, probably a, a bigger challenge to overcome. Um, but that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing a, a slight undercounting of trash in our in our kind of uh, initial pass through. Um, so what we're trying to do is to kind of get you know approach from the bottom of undercounting and trying to get closer and closer to what's really there. Um, and the way that we do that is um, applying additional uh, annotations uh, with, with, and, and also tweaking the parameters. Uh, there's a kind of a, a process that goes beyond what we can talk about here of rerunning things through a graphical processing unit to, um, to tune, further tune the, um, the algorithm after each test. Uh, so it's, it's not really a matter, I think, of going out and, and collecting uh, new imagery, but rerunning a lot of the the same test imagery through through the process until we can get a, a greater you know narrowing the gap between what is really there that measure of truth and and what we can see from the sky. But some but there will be some under undercounting I think just because it can't be seen from through the image right um, and so there's there's kind of two levels of undercounting. One is and and that's what the, the example of tobacco trash where we were just having someone count on the basis of the image uh, versus having the machine do it. We want to see, can even a human being identify the trash? Hi, really good presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, what algorithm are you using? We're using TensorFlow, uh, which there are different you know, varieties of it and different uh, proprietary systems take TensorFlow and, and add their own special sauce into it. Uh, so Microsoft, Google, Amazon uh, have developed their versions of it. We're using the a, a kind of non-proprietary version of it, um, kind of closer to the vanilla tuning. Uh, 
All right. Thank you. Up next, and to round out our trash and microplastic session, um, is Diane Lynn from SFEI. So now we're going to move from pieces of trash that we can see from a drone to tiny pieces of trash that we might need a microscope to see. And so I'm really excited to talk about our project, Monitoring Microplastic in the San Francisco Bay. Uh, this is really a first of its kind type of study for microplastic where we're doing a comprehensive regional study. And it's a million dollar project that's largely funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and included the collaboration of a lot of groups of people. So I just want to acknowledge some of my primary co-authors um, at SFBI, UC Davis, Five Gyres, and University of Toronto. And we're really excited to work with Chelsea Rockman, who's a professor at University of Toronto in this project, because she's a leading world expert on this topic. Microplast microplastics is a hot topic. Um, if you haven't noticed, it's being detected everywhere, not only in uh, the Pacific garbage patch, but also in remote areas that we wouldn't expect, like the deep oceans. And Basic, and the public is concerned about the microplastic that is being detected everywhere, and this is prompting action at the local, state, and federal level. So microplastics are small pieces of trash that are smaller than the definition of trash at the five millimeter. And they're essentially the detritus of modern day society where 350 million tons of plastic are produced annually. Um, and you might recognize these symbols um, underneath plastic containers that represent the different types of plastic um, and whether it can be recycled. Similarly, microplastic can be identified based on the type of plastic, and we try to use that to link that with potential sources of the microplastic. And we're concerned about microplastic because organisms that um, ingest or are exposed to the microplastic, um, it can create physical blockage, or the microplastic can be a vector for contaminants, either contaminants um, sorbed from the environment or chemicals that are added to the plastic to give it its chemical properties, such as flame retardants. And even though microplastic is a new science, so we don't yet know what the ecological impacts of microplastic is, but meanwhile, we know that microplastic is only going to keep increasing, and once it's in the environment, it's logistically impossible to remove. We can't just like pick them up. Um, and so we're concerned about microplastic, especially in areas that tend to accumulate contaminants, like the San Francisco Bay. And so um, three years ago, um, SFBI and our partners at Five Gyres embarked on an ambitious study to do the first comprehensive regional study of microplastic. This is a million dollar project funded mostly by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. And from the outset, the project was, was designed so that science could um, inform pollution prevention actions. Our team leaders are my colleagues at SFBI, Becky Sutton and Meg Sadlack, Carolyn Box at Five Gyres, and Chelsea Rockman at the University of Toronto, who is, as I mentioned before, a leading expert in the field. In our San Francisco Bay study, we wanted to sample different matrices to do a very comprehensive study. Uh, we collected samples from the bay surface water, fish, sediment, as well as surface water in the adjacent oceans. And to understand how the plastic is entering into the bay, we also sampled wastewater and stormwater. So I'm going to briefly highlight some key preliminary findings that we're finding from our bay water as well as uh, pollution pathways monitoring. And for the full results, I'll talk about more about that later of where you can get that. Uh, our surface water samples are collected using a manta trawl where um, a net is pulled over the water surface so that we're collecting water uh, particles that are floating on the surface. And those samples are rinsed and um, into a sample jar and shipped to the lab for laboratory analysis. Um, we have collected samples throughout the bay and adjacent oceans, which are national marine sanctuaries. And we wanted to compare differences between bay versus sanctuary, dry versus wet season, as well as look at in-bay regional variations. 
The samples are shipped to the University of Toronto where they are analyzed. Uh, the analysis involves trained staff who pick out particles that look like plastic. And each of the particles are characterized based on their color, their shape, um, and then measured for their dimensions. And so at this step, the count is of microparticles. And then a subset of those microparticles are further analyzed um, to confirm whether they are plastic um, using FTIR or Raman spectroscopy. And using that analysis, we can estimate a subset of the microparticles to be microplastic. Uh, based on our analysis, most of the microparticles counted uh, were, micro, uh, were plastic, uh, with the exception of fibers, where dyes that are embedded in the fiber often interfered with the spectroscopy, and so we couldn't tell what type of plastic it was, but we could confirm that uh, most of the particles were either anthropogenic or plastic. And did I mention that this process is really challenging? Um, <laughs> Each of our samples took about 30 hours of labor to analyze, and given we collected over 300 samples, it represented thousands of hours of work. Over 20 undergrad and graduate students did the work um, over the year to do this uh, sampling, and so we're really grateful for all of the work that they put into this. And currently, there are methods being developed to try to automate this process. Um, but Chelsea found that for our samples, those automated uh, software wasn't robust enough for um, counting and confirming the plastic. And so this was still the best method for our samples. So we found a lot of microplastic particles, which kind of explains why it took so long to analyze. And um, we saw huge variations in the abundance of microplastic. Um, and it varied by over three orders of magnitude from counts that were similar to our field blanks to um, counts of the million particles per kilometer squared. And so in this graph, these small circles represent less than 100,000 and these big ones are in the million particles per kilometer range. We did see a difference between wet season and dry season and this was statistically significant. And we also saw a greater abundance in the bay compared to the sanctuary, which was also statistically significant. And the most abundant type of fibers that we measured were fibers followed by fragments and foam particles. And uh, a majority of the fibers were confirmed to be plastic. Now to understand how the microplastic is entering the bay, we also sampled wastewater and stormwater. I wanted to mention that we sampled at eight facilities for wastewater and for stormwater, we sampled 12 watersheds. Um, in our microplastic, um, we found microplastic to be really abundant in stormwater. And about half of the particles in stormwater were black rubber fragments that look like they could come from black tires. And the most abundant type of particles we saw were fragments um, followed by fibers. And this was in contrast to wastewater, where most of the, the most abundant type of particles was fibers. And this makes sense, considering that laundry is a source, uh, could be a source of these fibers to uh, wastewater. Now, when we take our measurements from our wastewater sampling and our stormwater sampling and extrapolate it out to the whole bay, we found that the stormwater load is 200 times that of wastewater in terms of microplastic loading into the bay. And this was a really interesting finding to us because most of the research um, and efforts have focused on wastewater and uh, focusing on microfibers that are in wastewater. And so this has really shifted our focus um, so that our next steps are to uh, look more closely at stormwater, develop a conceptual model of what are the sources and, plastic, uh, sources and pathways of microplastic uh, to stormwater in the bay. So each of our particles are described based on their morphology, size, polymer, and color. And we're, all of our data is going to be publicly available. And so we're trying to develop a standard vocabulary to, uh, to share this data. Um, and currently, there aren't standard methods. And this is really important so that we can compare our study results with other studies globally. And I just want to mention this is one of the challenges with microplastic is that there aren't standard methods, not only for the data reporting, 
but also for the uh, field sampling and the laboratory analysis. And so all of the methods that we've been developing in the study, um, as well as our lessons learned, we're working to make sure that, uh, working with others to make sure that that supports the uh, standardization that is being developed for microplastic monitoring. So that's a brief summary of the science portion of our project. Um, the second portion of our project um, is to link science to solutions. I mentioned before that from the outset, our project was designed to inform uh, pollution prevention action and to inform policy. And so this is a part of the project that is led by our partners at Five Gyres. We convened a committee, uh, a policy committee of stakeholders from uh, various groups, including industry, government, foundation, and environmental groups working on pollution prevention efforts. Um, got them into a room in two meetings, presented them with our preliminary data results, um, and they used the data as a basis for discussion on uh, policy management and uh, tried to, and worked to prioritize 10 recommendations for next steps. Um, and so I'm going to briefly mention five of them. The group recommended a better understanding of stormwater based on our new finding that stormwater is an important load. And maybe in hindsight, when I listened to the trash presentation, maybe this isn't a surprise, but we didn't have any data to back this up. And so this was a really a big shift in our focus. There's also a lot of efforts currently um, in terms of trying to reduce microfiber as well as reduce single-use plastics from food packaging. And so based on the abundance of fibers, fragments, and foam that we're seeing in different matrices in the Bay, the group recommended uh, supporting and joining these efforts um, in terms of the discussion. And um, as my co-session uh, presenters and Tony, Walter, and Gary presented, there's a lot of trash efforts um, being done in parallel with microplastic and better collaboration and coordination is recommended. Um, so one example is um, at SFEI, our microplastic and trash project, um, both data sets will be uploaded to the same platform on CDIN. Last year, the California legislature passed a bill that requires the Ocean Protection Council to develop a management strategy for microplastic. And so um, this last recommendation I'm going to mention is um, to develop a Bay Area focused management strategy for microplastic. Key messages in case you spaced out at any moment. <laughs> all, my, all my points are in this slide. Microplastic is everywhere. We found microplastic in almost all of our samples. And we're concerned about the microplastic that, uh, that we're detecting um, because of their abundance and potential impacts on organisms. And it's challenging. Um, not only are there not standard methods that make it challenging, but just the laboratory analysis, like I mentioned before, is uh, very time consuming. Our San Francisco Bay study, where we did a comprehensive regional study of microplastic um, to understand its sources and pathways, is really the first of its kind. And um, an important finding that we found is that stormwater loading of microplastic is really important. And the science to policy framework that we developed, where from the outset we had a plan for delivering our science um, to, to discussions for developing policy, um, can be copied elsewhere. All of our results will be available in October. We have different communication strategies, including hosting a symposium, website, report, fact sheet, all of which will be publicly available and we will also be uploading our data. With that, thank you and I wanna thank my collaborators as well as our funders. Any questions? Go ahead, Gary. Wow, gosh, um, first thing, I, this is great. You're doing this work. It seems incredibly important, if uh, although slightly depressing. Um, <laughs> and, and it actually makes, you know, the, the, these uh, litter problems we're working on seem fairly uh, trivial in comparison for the challenges that we face to deal with them. Um, 
The first time this came on my radar was just a couple of months ago when I heard an NPR story about detection of plastics at the top of the Pyrenees. Maybe that was one of the articles that you had up there. Um, but I'm curious in development of this conceptual model, so, so you found that stormwater is important, um, being that it's, it's not only in the water, but it's also, you seems, ubiquitous floating in the air around us and we're breathing it. Do you have any uh, intuitive sense yet as to the relative importance of atmospheric deposition to the bay relative to coming from stormwater? Yeah, that's a really good uh, question. We didn't um, analyze air, but I guess we don't have data for that. And so the short answer is we don't, and that's a really big data gap that we want to try to address. Um, Zach Bradford, League to Save Lake Tahoe. Uh, we are currently working with uh, Desert Research Institute on a similar study in uh, Lake Tahoe. And we have a very, we have a unique opportunity because we don't have storm, or sorry, we don't have treated wastewater going into Tahoe. So we're hoping to be able to, differ, to differentiate whether we are having atmospheric deposition of fibers, at least, uh, in the lake. So I'm definitely interested in, in talking more. Um, but additional question, uh, when you're looking at your protocols, um, were you able to find whether you could differentiate any bioplastics? Were you able to separate that out at all with uh, any of the analysis? Um, so with the Raman spectroscopy, um, Chelsea has developed a library of different polymers, and so in some cases we can identify the types of plastic, and um, including bioplastics. Hello. I think in the beginning, one of the matrices you said you looked at was fish. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about those results, uh, what your findings were, and when those results might be available on Seedon? Yep. Uh, so, yeah, so we collected fish samples throughout the bay. Um, we collected anchovies and top smelt and analyzed micro... I'm trying to figure out how I can be calling up for this. Okay. Um, so we analyzed microplastic in the guts of the, micro, um, of the fish, and we did detect uh, microplastic in 99% of them. And uh, well, all of our data will be um, available in October. But I, um, anyways, if you're interested, I can, like, I have like a poster and stuff that I could share with you. Hi. Um, I was wondering what the resolution on these methods are, like what the method detection limit is, and if people who haven't studied this as in depth, if you have a sense of what the impact thresholds are for organisms of the bay or other perhaps impact thresholds I'm not thinking of? Yeah, super good question. Um, so there aren't standard methods, and so um, I think we're still, tr it, there's no, no defined method of figuring out what the method detection limit is. Um, data quality was really important to us from the outset of the study, and so we did collect field blanks and field duplicates to try to understand kind of what is the background contamination. And um, this is so new that a lot of studies don't even collect field blanks. Um, so, and the problem with, uh, with microplastic is that the contamination can be very sporadic. Um, it's not like your typical contaminant, and so we're still trying to figure out how to, um, just kind of how to estimate the, that, that baseline background contamination that's possible. And so I don't have a very clear answer, but we're trying to figure that out. Yes, so I guess so for our field blanks, we did analyze them, and so we do detect um, a certain level of mic microparticles in the sample, so we would use that as kind of our background. It's different for each matrices because it requires different processing, and, um, and the, the lab can have different uh, levels of cleanliness in terms of having, and so a lot of things can uh, affect that, and so we would want to collect that blank for each type of matrices and each type of sample that you're analyzing. 
Um, and in terms of the ecological impact, that's also a super good question. Um, there's still not enough science out there, but we're still concerned um, even, as I mentioned before, because levels are only increasing. And so um, it seems like it would all be more like a matter of time before we might meet those thresholds depending on what, um, when we have that data available. Um, I thought it was really interesting that you, you found that the majority of microplastics in the bay were fibers, um, but then when you compared stormwater to wastewater, it sounds like uh, stormwater, which had provided the vast majority of microplastics, um, fibers are actually in the minority of what you found. So where do you think all those fibers are coming from that are found in the bay? Um, I think the wastewater could be a source, and as well as air deposition. We were also um, in, um, intrigued to find about those rubber fragments, but rubber tends to sink. And so um, I am just processing the sediment data right now, and so that could be a reservoir for those particles that we aren't seeing in the bay surface water samples. Thanks. Hi, kind of two questions. One, um, I think it's fascinating that you were mentioning that you were going through and identifying the different types of plastics in the, um, in the constituents you were finding, because then you'd be able to tell, is this from medical grade trash or is it from takeout food service containers? And that really helps for source control, right? Um, and full disclosure, I work for a wastewater agency. So my second question, my first question is, is that data going to come out when all the data comes out in October? Just kind of breaking down, you know, 5% of it was medical, 40% was food containers. Maybe it's the opposite. Um, and then second of all, has there been any discussion by the financiers of possibly doing like pilot studies of source control for the microfibers, like having wastewater dischargers if you went in a, t in a sewer shed and had them use those kind of devices that have been developed for washing machines to really contain the microfibers that get, you know, introduced into the sewer system that maybe that could have a drastic reduction in the discharge versus trying to have wastewater plants there's been some talk about, can we redo our wastewater infrastructure to catch microfibers? And as I'm sure you know, that is exceedingly complicated, if not impossible. Um, so just interested in whether there might be investments in source control on the microfiber side. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, let's see, so the first question was on? The plastic identification. Yes, so all of our data will be available, and so we'll, we'll have that breakdown in terms of like, um, from our analysis, what percentage was polypropylene? How much was polyethylene? In terms of link, we can make that. We can try to link those with potential sources of like this type of plastic is used a lot in water bottles. Um, but the plastic doesn't really say like I came from a certain water bottle and stuff like that. So that that would be hard to do. Um, and then in terms of microfiber reduction, yes, I totally agree. It would be prohibitively expensive to uh, remove microfibers at the wastewater plant level. Um, there is um, a lot of research trying to have in like, uh, trying to figure out at what point would be effective in terms of removing microfibers, like in terms of the personal machine within the laundry with a filter in different stages, what the best intervention point is. 